You guys are thoroughly read for today, right? That's right, of course. This is actually one of my favorite blocks, local anesthetics. Local anesthetics can be used for a lot of things. We give them intravenously to help with ventricular tachycardia or PVCs. We give it to make things hurt less when we inject them. We give it to blunt some of the sympathetic response to laryngoscopy. Lots of great uses. You can actually use this to break a bronchospasm. Believe it or not, because what is it doing? It decreases nerve activity. And if you can decrease parasympathetic nerve firing to the lungs, you're going to open up the lungs a little bit better. Right? Funny thing about local anesthetics is that they don't work on top of the cell. It actually has to get inside of the cell and bind underneath the receptor, the sodium, or the voltage-gated sodium channel. And by doing so, it will block nerve impulses. Now, there's a lot of different ways you can induce anesthesia. Right? You can do it with the gases, as we talked about. You can induce sensation or loss of sensation to a limited part of the body with local anesthetics. Back in the day, they used to inject alcohol to kill nerves and create an anesthetic effect. You can use cold. Some of you may have used that in your practice, but what, it, what you've done is you have stopped nerve conduction, and that's basically what we're going to be talking about. Jeffrey, what's the difference between local anesthesia and regional anesthesia? Good. So regional affects an entire region of the body. Right? Local will affect just the surface, the, the peripheral field surface. I'm going to move through the history here. You can read it on your own. Now, what are some of the desirable properties of a local anesthetic? Short acting, if you're wanting control, but long acting if you want pain relief. And so one of the local anesthetics that makes the most money right now is rohypocaine and bupipocaine. Why? They're long lasting. Because they last a long time. So you give somebody a nerve block, that's going to last 12, 24, sometimes 36 hours. And when it wears off, you would like that local anesthetic to wear off quickly. Anybody here ever have a block? Did you feel the pins and needles as you lost control? Or did you feel the paresthesia as it came back? Sometimes you sometimes you'll feel the pins and needles as it goes away, and then as you recover, you'll feel the pins and needles and paresthesia as your function returns. Yep, it was muscle, quite muscle. Another thing that is a potential danger to you, especially, is vascular injection, especially with a peripheral nerve block. And so you want that drug, ideally, to have a low index of toxicity. And that's one of the reasons why rohypocaine was created, right, to counter, to get the same effects as bupipocaine, but not have the toxicity of bupipocaine. Now this picture hopefully will be ingrained in your head. Notice what we have here. This is a typical cartoon structure of a local anesthetic. And we have an aromatic ring here. So what do you know about rings, at least in pharmacology? Are they hydrophilic or lipophilic? They're lipophilic. So that tells you that that yellow end is your most lipophilic part of that local anesthetic. Now the gray portion is your carbon chain. It is what links the arom aromatic end with the amine end. And that's going to determine how it fits in the channel. And we'll discuss that. Your purple end, your amine end, that's where you're going to get your nitrogen, nitrogen groupings, and that part will become charged. 
there's a reason that we're going to focus on that charge then. What is necessary for a drug to bind to a receptor? A, a charge. So it is that purple one that's responsible for your binding. Now here are the typical local anesthetics. They're divided into two groups. One group is the amino esters, and the other group is the amide group. If you want an easy way to remember which is in what group, just remember Captain Ester, CPT, chloroprocaine, procaine. If you want to include cocaine, that's fine. Right, so cocaine, chloroprocaine, propane, and pectocaine, Captain Esther. And then double I, am I. Because lidocaine has two eyes in it. Trilocaine has two eyes in it. Ethylocaine has two eyes in it, so on and so forth. So Captain Esther, double I, am I. Esters are broken down by? Esterases. Esterases. Amides are broken down where? In the liver. So once again, it's that yellow ring, that aromatic ring, that's going to give you the lipophilic properties of that local anesthetic. And what will that determine? Okay, in part, but also how well it does what? It crosses the membrane. Because in order to get to where this local <laughs> anesthetic is going to work, what does it have to do? It has to cross cell membranes because it works on the inside of the cell. This ester bond, or I'm sorry, not this ester bond, this carbon chain, that middle portion, that gray portion, we would like that carbon length to be ideally between three and seven carbon uh, molecules. Now, if you lengthen that carbon chain, if you lengthen that carbon chain, that will determine the length of that anesthetic activity. As well, what happens if you can increase the time of that anesthetic activity? What does that also increase? Therapeutic effects. Maybe, maybe. So how about potency? But that's not your best choice. If I were to say potency, what do you think would be the part of the molecule that would be most responsible for potency? The, the aromatic ring, like the lipid end. <clears throat> yeah. So you would say that uh, when the carbon ring is less than the other one, it's very That's right. So the longer the carbon ring is, is it that? Between three and seven, it's hard to fit. It's hard to fit where it's supposed to fit. It's all about the size, the fit of the molecule in the domain. Yes. Yeah, his question was: the longer it is, does it come off quicker? Yes. Now imagine this is only so long at your desk. You can put a certain stick in there, but if it's too short, it doesn't stay very long. Well. If it's too long, it doesn't fit. Does that make sense? The, the carbon chain determines the fit, if you will, of where it binds, how well it binds, and how well it will stay there. If it's too short, it doesn't claim anything. If it's too long, it can't fit. So when you said it's too long, or longer chains equal longer duration, you meant Up to seven, yes. Okay. Once you start getting over seven, you start running into problems. The aromatic ring is most determinant of your lipophilic qualities and your potency. So, up to seven carbons, or if you can make that yellow aromatic ring very lipophilic, not only do you increase potency, but 
as Justin said, you also are going to see an increase in toxic side effects. Because think about this. What do these drugs block? Sodium channels. What is the rhythm of your heart determined upon? Sodium channels. Voltage-gated sodium channels are voltage-gated sodium channels. Now, I'm not going to go over the... You went over this physiology with... Uh, Dr. Christie, no? Yes. So you understand this upslope and the downslope and all of the sodium channels. The one thing I will go over is how local anesthetics will affect that rise in slope. So that slope is an indication of your action potential. Correct? Once a certain pressure... Yes? Um. I didn't skip over. Sorry. Um, I, I just missed it. Thank you for making me go back. So, once again, the amino group. Wait, good catch, because I think it just got, my clicker got happy. The amino group, what did I say that it was responsible for? Binding. Binding. And, what, and how do you bind? Charge. So that's the key point with the amino group. That is going to be responsible for your clinging, if you will, to the receptor. Your protein binding. Thank you for that. So we all can see this normal slope of an action potential. And an action potential slope is an action potential slope. But the local potential slope, can that be altered? Yes. Right? So if I bind up a certain number of voltage-gated sodium channels, do you understand why now that local potential threshold, right? So let me orient you to this. This is uh, the threshold here. Right? We ever, we, you all see the arrow where it says threshold? Now imagine you've added some local anesthetic to that. In fact, let me see if I can... This is a local potential threshold? Yeah. Uh, right here, this is your action potential threshold. You start having a local potential here. Correct? Now if I start adding sodium channel blockade, what happens to this local potential threshold? It starts moving. Hang on. So hopefully this pen will work. So this now, after a period of time, will take longer to get there. Right? And then it'll shoot up. Everybody see that? So your local potential threshold will change. Now has resting membrane potential changed? No. You're just making it harder to do what? And where do you summate all of these potentials? Well, the, exactly, at the axon hillock. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. Piggy first with the question over here. Oh, uh, change in velocity over change in time. Yes. Yes. No. Remember, an actual potential threshold never changes. The ability to get there. <laughs> yes. No, no. Are you affecting the concentration of ions on either side of the membrane? No. No. Local anesthetics that affect amplitude. For the first time that we've ever talked about being able to decrease the amplitude. Amplitude doesn't change. Only the resting or the local potential. The ability to get. At, once you fire the gun, you fire the gun. Right? That's it. Once you fire the gun, it fires. But 
If I put something in between the trigger, is that easier to fire now? No. It's harder to get that trigger pulled now. That's the example here. The trigger is always the trigger. The ability to activate the trigger is effective. Yes, sir? Yes. That is the threshold to fire, the action potential threshold. All right? It increases the number, it increases the stimulus that you need to fire the gun. That's a, that's a poor choice of wording out of that particular textbook because the threshold potential will never change. But the ability to reach that threshold potential is harder now. You are blocking sodium channels. <coughs> so when you have, for example, the motor end plate, that's a series of local potentials that add up for a action potential. It's the same concept. Sodium in, but if you block those sodium channels, you can't have those local potentials to reach that action potential threshold. Yes? Um, we, uh, I'm just going to make a comment because me and Smithers just talked about this. It's that whole uh, three stages of confirmation of the sodium channel. Yes. Um, so it just, it's taking longer to, uh, since it's blocking, it's taking longer to reach threshold. So threshold for action potential may or may not be reached because the lidocaine is the, or the local incentive is blocking. Yeah, remember those gates on the sodium channels? I mean, they stay closed. Not exactly. You can't. They stay closed. You don't open them. Oh, because you block sodium channels. Your sodium production has increased slightly. I wouldn't get caught up on that. Get caught up on the fact that fire and action potential, it's harder. And if you understand that you're blocking local potentials, and ultimately, you don't have any local potentials. Therefore, you can have zero action potentials. Yes. Voltage-gated sodium channels or voltage-gated sodium channels or voltage-gated sodium channels. The wording. Don't get hung up on the wording. All right? If you have a question on the wording, ask me. When they say increased threshold, they're saying functional. Function, the functionality. A functional threshold. The ability to reach that. Okay. And not serve them on. Got it? True or false? Local anesthetics will dampen the activity of excitable tissue. True. 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 Mm -hmm. True. Okay. I'm not going to go into the function. This is all telling you about the sodium channels and how. Sodium goes in and potassium goes out. And you were just talking about the sodium gates. I'm not going to rehash that. I'm not going to rehash this. This is all stuff that I'm going to leave to you to review. So you must, you must, you must review your nerve physiology from Dr. Christie. Otherwise, we won't have enough time to get through what we need to get through. Now, we will go through this thing called state-dependent blockade. There's three configurations of the sodium channel. Do you agree? Yes, yes. yes. There is a closed configuration, the activated or open configuration, and the inactive configuration, where it's just been fired, but it hasn't completely reset. <coughs> Say again? No, inactivated is not a closed channel. Yeah, closed, open, she and said inactivated. She said de She said de so a, de a deactivated channel can be an inactive channel or a closed channel. It just depends on if it reset properly. Yes. I'm going to refer, so for me, I'm going to refer to closed, I'm not going to use deactivated. I'm not going to use that term. I'm going to use closed, open, or inactivated. Okay. Because I don't want to step on anybody's stomach. Hmm? Okay. 
So this is talking about the resting membrane potential. I'll leave that to you. However, this is a concept right here that is similar to the neuromuscular junction. This one. Well, you can't reset when it's open. You haven't reset yet when it's an active. When you say can't reset, that's absolute. Can't reset means that it's either staying continuously open, or it has been blocked, or it is an enclosed configuration, which is a reset configuration. I don't, I'm going to use those terms. How inactivated means that you haven't changed your gates yet to the closed position. Inactivated means that it just fired. Closed. The resting position is the closed position. It's closed to the outside, but it's open to the inside of the side. Yes. Because the inactivated means that gate from underneath comes up underneath, and then the one up top has to close, and then the one at the bottom has to open back up to be in the closed configuration. Inactivated would be the active Yes, yes, yes. But that top, that bottom gate is closed. There's no facility going in. All right. So like the neuromuscular junction, there is a margin of safety built into your nerve conduction. So you can have, and we'll use the term 90%, right? So cross out that 80, I'll go with 90. You can have up to 90% of your sodium channels blocked along your nerve and still conduct an However, does that action potential fire as repetitively or as quickly as it may have once fired? All right, you're going to fire once, and it's going to take a little bit longer, but you can fire again. It'll take a little bit longer, but you can fire again. Because what has decreased? The number of channels. The number of channels available and the slope of the local potential has drifted to the right of it. Remember that slide? Okay. Now look at this nerve fiber. And imagine being a local anesthetic molecule. You don't work on the perineurium. What do you have to do? You have to soak your way inside of that nerve fiber. And the nerve fibers are configured so that if you want to make somebody quit moving, those nerve fibers are deep in the middle. But if you just want to take away somebody's pain, those are more configured around the outside of the nerve fiber. So your location of your local anesthetic will determine whether you have analgesic properties or if you have, in fact, anesthetic properties in which you can't feel and cannot move. Okay? And lo and behold, here is that cartoon depiction. For your purpose, for your help, I have taken this picture and talked about it in a little vignette. So if you don't get it when I'm saying it now, you can listen to it over and over again. Now look at that cartoon configuration of a nerve fiber. Now look at the small green circles that's supposed to be green. That's a B fiber. What do you know about B fibers? What are they responsible for? Sympathetic stuff, right? Autonomic stuff. Right? What about those little red C fibers? What are they responsible for? Pain. What's the difference between the B fiber and the little red C fibers? Myelination. Okay. And if I'm a local anesthetic, if I'm a local anesthetic, which nerve am I going to block easier? The C fiber. Okay. Now look at that little blue A delta fiber. What is that responsible for? Not A delta. Fast pain. Your sharp pain. It hurts. And then you get your motor fibers, those big yellow ones, your A alpha, your A beta, your A uh, gamma. Those are going to go to your muscle spindles. There's going to be, you know, proprioception and movement. So 
think about this picture every time you administer a local anesthetic molecule. And you'll always remember what it's doing. Now, is the onset for motor paralysis quick? No, because it's got to get to the center of the nerve fiber. Now, that myelin is tough to penetrate if you're a local anesthetic. Because the local anesthetic has to be lipophilic to pass to the cell membrane, but then it has to do what again? It has to charge, recharge, and then bind to the inner portion of that sodium channel. Doesn't it sound like I'm going to be setting up Henderson some hassle back again? No, sir, say it ain't true. It's true. And how about this note of Ranbeer? Uh, uh, Ranbeer. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> America. 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 All right. This is when you're going to have a high concentration of your sodium channel. And so that's the target in the myelinated tissue of your local anesthetic. And I'm going to say this over and over and over. You have to block three of these nodes to stop nerve conduction. That's called your critical length. You have to stop three of these nodes to stop nerve conduction, which is that saltatory nerve conduction. Again, as you read through these notes, don't forget about your physiology. I'm not going to waste this time going over the physiology because you've already had it, so make sure you review it. Now, there's no nodes in the non myelinated fiber. That makes sense. That makes sense. Now, let's take a look at this and go over it one more time. So this is the second time this slide has shown up in this short period. This concept probably is important. So if I were you, I would definitely know this top chart and be able to relate it to the bottom. So let's look at our B fiber. Our B fibers are our preganglionic autonomic nerve fibers. They have some myelin. They're fairly fast. But look at the sensitivity to block. It has four pluses. It's very sensitive to block because it's on the outside and it's lightly myelinated. That means the nodes are a little bit closer together. It's a smaller nerve, right? So what will happen when you block this nerve? The B fiber. Okay, and then what will happen? You don't transmit the action. Nope, you don't transmit either your parasympathetic or your sympathetic response to your target organ. And what typically will happen when you, who here has seen an epidural kidney? What happens that they have to give fluid, repressors for? They have vasodilate. Your autonomic nervous system has been affected. Right? You can't. You can't control it. And what happens when you vasodilate? What happens to your heart rate? It heats up. Aha! But let's say you put a spinal in. We talked about spinals, and it's dependent. You are all in that lab, and we talked about it. Its location depends on vericity. And so if you put in that local anesthetic, and you're blocking these sympathetic fibers to your, to your lower trunk and your abdomen, and some of those fibers get to the accelerator fibers that are responsible for kicking up your heart rate. Now you become hypotensive, and does your heart rate go up? No, because you've increased that block to the point where you've affected those autonomic fibers. Everybody see that? Your T1 to T4 accelerator fibers are what's going to kick in your barrel receptor response. So if you block those fibers, your response to hypotension will still be bradycardia. Now, will atropine work in that situation? No, it won't. Can someone tell me why atropine will not work in that situation? So 
So the vagus nerve is compromised. And what is atropine? It's an anti-muscarinic. What keeps the heart going high? Norepinephrine. What have you just done to the T1, T4 fibers? Block them. And what comes out of the T1, T4 fibers? Norepinephrine. So atropine's not going to work if you have a high blockade. If you have a high local anesthetic blockade, you hit all autonomic fibers to include the parasympathetic and sympathetic. If you give atropine to try to increase heart rate when you have a high local anesthetic block, it will not work because atropine is an antimuscarinic. And you require a catecholamine to increase your heart rate at that point. And what catecholamine might you choose in a high blockade? That's probably in your cart. Epinephrine. Do you see why atropine does not work? Okay. Now let's look at the C fibers. That's that slow pain. And so now you get that local anesthetic in there. And man, that aching that you felt in your back, it just goes away. You're like, oh, so thankful. That little ache that goes away. But then I, I'm testing your block and I hit you with a needle. You're like, ouch, that still hurts. I've only taken care of the chronic pain. I haven't hit that sharp pain yet. Because I need to block what? I need to hit my A delta. It's a little bit harder to block because it's a thicker, longer, bigger nerve fiber. Now I'm feeling better. You can poke me all day long and I don't feel it. But my legs are starting to get heavy too. Why are my legs getting heavy? Because I'm starting to hit the A alpha, A beta, A gamma nerves. So please, please, please talk yourselves through up and down this chart. How do look line aesthetics work? Starting oh, line. Any questions on that? What time did we start? Twelve thirty ish. Just just who? When you're ready for a break, somebody can raise your hand. Okay. All right. Is there a reversal agent for local anesthetics? They're reversibly blind, but is there a reversal agent? There is not. Tincture of time, who said that? The tincture of time is the only thing that's going to make this go away, and that's going to require law of mass action to diffuse away from the site. That doesn't go away, law of mass action. The more you have on the outside, the more you're going to have on the inside. Okay. With that being said, which class of local anesthetics do you think lasts longer? The esters or the amides? Right? Because the esters are broken down by esters, and there's much more of an ability to do that. In general, the esters are your shorter acting agents. It's a general statement. Now, the blue words here, I would probably remember. This sodium channel is composed of four domains, okay? Uh, let me do this. Domain, domain one, two, three, and four. Now, when you're looking at this picture, the only thing they did was take one of these domains and bring it down into this circle. You see those six segments? There's six segments here. There's six segments here. Okay? Each one of these segments has four subunits. So when you're looking at that, that's all that is saying. Now, hopefully, the thing that you remember out of that is that you're a local anesthetic molecule, so you're going to stick to either segment, segment six of domain one, segment six of domain three, or segment six of domain four. 
That's where you find your way in and you stick and you interrupt sodium conduction. And it's nice to know that three to seven carbons, that fiber length of that molecule, or that molecule length, that carbon length of that molecule, seems to best fit in this area of 11 angstroms. That's it for mechanism. I mean, that's its mechanism. So it stops sodium conduction. And here's a chart to show you some relative pKa's and relative partition coefficients. Notice I said relative. So your job is to know which one's the highest, the lowest, in regards to pKa's and partition coefficients. I'm not asking you to memorize the numbers. But you should know that chloroprocane has a higher pKa than lidocaine. I should be able to ask you those kind of questions. Okay? Now this is a good chart because it takes into account protein binding, lipid solubility, and pKa. Why is pKa so important? What do you think, Jesse? Any idea why pKa might be so important? This can determine um, the pH in which it's going to act best at. That's right. So, you know that pKa is the pH in which 50% of this molecule will be charged and 50% of this molecule will be uncharged. So, the higher the pKa is, at least for these bases, these are all weak bases, so the higher the pKa, the, long, the, the greater the distance it is away from physiologic pH of 7.4, the more ionized, the more charged it's going to be when you inject it into the body. So the re, one of the reasons that lidocaine has a quicker onset than uh, bupivacaine is that it is closer to physiologic pH. A greater proportion of it will be uncharged when delivered into the body. And if you're uncharged, what can you do? Cross membranes. Cross membranes. But then what? You have to recharge again, don't forget, in order to bind to the sodium channel. So imagine that in your mind. I'm a local anesthetic molecule. I'm going to have to become uncharged, cross the membrane, and then recharge again to bind. All right? I'm not too worried about this slide. This is just for if you want to compare lipid solubility with volume distribution. All I want you to know is the relativities of protein binding, <coughs> lipid solubility, and pKa. This is higher than this. This is higher than that. This is lower than that. You said pKa protein binding. What was the third one? Uh, lipid solubility, partition coefficients. Thank you. So once again, you're that local anesthetic molecule. You're a base. In your neutral form, you are just a base. In order for you to charge, you need to acquire a hydrogen. So hopefully it makes sense now that if I take this base, and we'll say base X has a pKa of 9. So at a pH of 9, base X... 50% of it is charged and 50% of it is not charged. But now I'm going to take this base X and put it into a lower pH. What are there more of now at a lower pH? It's hydrogen ions. And so what does that hydrogen ion do? It binds. And if that hydrogen ion binds to this local anesthetic, does it cross membranes easily? Correct. It does not cross very easily. That's Henderson Hasselbeck in a nutshell. But is it just that simple? No. One thing I can promise you is that that formula in the top right is something, it's something that is easily remembered. And you can use it for anything. You can use it for anything. All right. So if you are a weak base, 
base x, and we're, for this example, we're going to say base x has a pKa of 9.4. And we're going to inject it into the body, and the body has a pH roughly of 7.4. I would like you to be able to tell me, according to that equation in the top right in the white box, how many parts of that molecule will be charged for every one part of the molecule that is uncharged. So the way you do that is you say, okay, this is just an extrapolation of a logarithmic equation. and He just put it into a mathematical equation. So he's saying that the ratio of the base with the hydrogen attached over the base alone is equal to 10 to the pKa minus the pH power. So I just told you that the pKa was 9.4. And you're injecting it into a pH of 7.4. So I know now that that ratio is equal to 10 to the 9.4 minus 7.4 power. So that ratio is equal to 10 squared. That ratio is equal to 100. So for every 100 parts of this example that are bound to hydrogen, hydrogen, one part is not bound and is not charged. You see that, I mean, that is, huh? For every 100 parts charged, there's one part that is uncharged. Now, do you, you think that that base X... We just know it. Do you think that base X will pass membranes easily? If 100 parts are charged, for every one part is uncharged? No. So what do you think about its onset? No, no. It's going to take a while. Right? It's going to take a while. Are you all, can you, you all see that in your heads? Finally, the first time someone said that, like a month and a half ago, I'm with you. Okay. Did you have a question? And it's probably a little bit of a question. Oh, so he said, sir, I'm going to give you an example. Is 100 really that much? And what do you think that depends upon? Are you saying that the higher the concentration, the quicker your onset? Yes. That's what he's saying. Come on now. I'm probably have fun up here. It's all good. You don't hurt my feelings. Oh, yeah. Okay, I can do that. I can do that. But you're absolutely right. And guess what clinical example you were talking about? So you're going to learn chloropropane has an excellent onset. Right? But what's the problem with chloropropane? Its pKa is 9.3. So how do you overcome it? You give a butt load. Or a crap ton, whatever you want to call it. Right? So there's a reason you use bupipacane at 0.25%. And then there's a reason you use nesicane or chloropropane at 3%. Right? It's one thing to use two and a half milligrams per ml. It's another thing to use 30 milligrams per ml. Yes? We're getting there. Now, for those of you that are not mathematically inclined, this will hopefully help you. In the res, on the left, is you have a weak acid bound to hydrogen. And on the right, you have a weak acid in the red by itself. A weak acid by itself is charged. On the bottom, in the blue, you have a weak base bound to hydrogen. But that one is charged because when bases are by themselves, they're not charged. So let's you look at that same example we just did. We said that our pKa was 9.4. And we have a weak base. We're going to put that drug into an environment in which the pH is less 
than the pKa. What does that tell you that a preponderance of that drug is? Charged. And that's how you use that chart. Now that we've talked about that, I'm coming back to this picture of the BH, B plus H equals BH plus, and look at what you have to traverse. And think about that for a second. You will have a couple barriers that you have to go through the perineurium, the epineurium, or the endoneurium. So you've got to traver, traverse this barrier, and then you've got to traverse this barrier, and then you have to charge again. And what are you doing at every step? Charging, uncharging, charging, uncharging. So you're, Michael is absolutely correct. If I give a bunch of it, then yeah, I'm going to push a lot more uncharged part. But if I were to give equal amounts of lidocaine, if I give equal milligrams of lidocaine and I give equal milligrams of chloroprocaine, equal amounts, not concentration, just equal numbers of molecules, which one will set up first? Because the pKa of lidocaine is 7.9. The pKa of chloroprocaine is 9.3. Lidocaine. lidocaine is going to set up quicker because it's closer to physiologic pH. A larger proportion of that molecule will be uncharged. But again, how do we overcome chloropropane? We give a crap ton. We give 3%. Are, are any of these manufactured outside the 3 to 7 range? Like we can assume that's a level playing field? For your purposes, yes. Mm -hmm. How many people have tried to inject local anesthetic into an infected area? Did it work very well? And now you know why. What is the pH usually of an infected area? It's pretty low. And what do you have more of in that infected area? Hydrogen ions. And what kind of a drug is a local anesthetic? It's a weak base. So if it combines with that hydrogen, it becomes charged and it doesn't go anywhere. Now you know why injecting local anesthetic to an infected area doesn't work. So let's go over these activity relationships once again. If I lengthen the carbon chain up to a point, and that point for you guys is seven, I'm going to increase potency but also increase toxicity. If I make the aromatic ring bigger, for your purposes, if I change it and make it bigger with these alkyl substitutions, or if I put a tertiary uncharged amine on it, I make it more lipophilic. And if I'm more lipophilic, I'm more potent. Take a break before we get back into the configurations of the receptors. I'm tracking my lecture, not too bad. This better lecture? Oh, oh, it's great. I go back to this. Protonate, unprotonate, charge, I'm sure that's great. Gotcha. So I guess you have here the formula. Yep. Very similar. I use like pH equals pKa plus the base. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm tracking. I still get the negative. I'm going off of this. I get my negative number. It's negative 2. Yeah. 1 over 100. Same thing. Unprotonated versus protonated. So it's, it's that, it. That, that language is the same. Charged. The same. Doesn't so change. Charged, uncharged. That's right. Charged, uncharged. Yeah. But but if you're protonated, mm -hmm. and your charge is going to depend on if you're a weak acid or a weak base. It's, okay. As far as being negative, positive. As far as being charged. Okay. Yeah. Because so, these two are not charged. Right. So when I when I when I, when I say protonated or when I say ionized, I see a charge. Yes. That, which is. So, that, so as far as what I understand, so you're I saying say, here that this is BH plus and this is B. That's mm -hmm. what you're saying. So, so protonated, unprotonated, probably uh, not a thermal wave. I would learn this with the BH plus and the AH and the B plus and the B and the A minus. Okay. So, so in this example, it would be charge on charge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as long as you know where your charges are at. I see, I see. So, so I try, when I say ionized, it's still generalized. 
It's not so ionized over. just means that you put it's a hydrogen on the plastic. Yeah. yeah, so <laughs> I would say either, I would know, you need to know that I'm talking about a weak base. And if I say ionized with a weak base, I'm talking about this. Yeah. If I say ionized with a weak acid, I'm talking about this. Yes, I fully understand that part of it. That's right. When I understand an ionized, I'm going to add you to the Oh, then you can use ionized and ionized yeah. then. Like, as like long as you don't confuse that. Yeah. Yeah. It's more to make sure I'm saying the right thing. So so because yeah. I screw it up here sometimes. I get going too fast, so I always try to make sure I'm sticking with me. Yeah, I am. Cation, anion, whatever it is. I can see it. I'm thinking of it. Good. I had the same question to you. I have some flashbacks. I have a little flashbacks from this morning that we're going to right here. Not that I didn't understand it, but I was like, that's fine. So, I'll just work. So if I got a drug that has, if I got a weak base, my PKA is 10. I'm going to turn it into a pH of 11. Where am I at? Oh, I can see that. pH is 11, the PKA is 10. This is the pH in relation to the pH. The yeah. simplest way that I could. Yeah, the reason I asked that question is because, like, we know it's going to have to before. And, you know, sometimes we're looking to compare two different drugs, and, like, you're in the book, and it's like, well, this one's 100 to 1, and you would say, well, that one's more like 50 to 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 50 that, you know, all time. Yeah, one of the one that's still a lot of it going out. That's great. I mean, that's exactly what we do for a function. We get a lot of them. We get a lot of functions at 10,000. I think that was the point. They kind of said, well, wait a minute. You know what? I guess we got like a trillion of these models. I was tracking with you. Yes, I got it. Well, the answer probably is more information than I was even thinking of. So that was good. I can't write anything going on. Since we said we're not deploying, you know, it's a project. Say my my low point set is a K of five, okay? And I inject it into the body and stuff. I hate it, Henderson Hasselbeck. Right. Uh, it's old, it's old. No, it makes sense. I got no. 
to me that the equation makes the most sense. Oh, that's, yeah, and I think the first time I saw this chart was me. Kind of like, what is he saying? Yeah, but, yeah, that, that clears it up. I could, I could present that to somebody. Not you or somebody smarter than me. I just remember in nursing school, right? We got, we always got the question, why do you take acid PO? I said what? Why do you take, or aspirin PO? Oh, 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 oh. Right, the pKa of aspirin is three, and the pKa or the pH of the stomach is three or one. So you can just this acid, this More likely to bind in like, yeah. uh, I'll give you a clinical example. Okay. So when I kind of do the plasticity thing, I learned that a lidocaine likes to bind to the inside of the channel. It always does all the plasticity. Right. So would it make sense for it to bind when it's open so it can get in there and bind? Or? No? It's when it it's inactive? Yeah. Right. But remember the gate. When it's open, it's, when it's, oh no, when it's open, it's open. But yeah, it has something to do with it. It doesn't seem to follow the sodium. Okay. Um, I remember what you were talking about the space that these are all basically yeah. a series of ones that has been put out. And I know it's like an acid, and I was looking like the primary. It has, it has a specific PKA. Right, and it was specifically for like IMTs and things of that nature. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It, 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 now, you can have an acidic PKA and still be like this. Okay. And those are independent. Thank you. 215? Sorry, 215? All right, here we go. Let's get back to this configuration thingy. I'm going to dig it. If you know this picture, I'm happy. All right, and what is it saying to you, this picture? This picture is telling you that once the sodium channel has fired and is in its refractory period, that's when it's more susceptible to sodium channel blockade. Let me give you a clinical example to try and reinforce it. How many people here have used lidocaine? How many people here have used lidocaine? with ischemic hearts that have ventricular ectopy. A lot, right? So why is that ventricle having ectopy? 
It's excitable because there's an area of infarction injury which has disrupted the cell membrane and made things easier to fire. So it's, you know, it's, it's going off, it's doing its thing. And lidocaine likes to bind to preferentially ischemic tissue, more excitable tissue. More excitable tissue fires more frequently. Why? Because it's excitable. And so, there's probably a greater proportion of the sodium channels in the inactivated state. So you can speculate that lidocaine prefers to bind to that inactive sodium channel in that ischemic heart to help reduce the number of PBCs and ventricular activity. So the point, and I understand it's purely academic, but lidocaine, it actually seems to be real is that the more a tissue fires, the more prone it is, the more likely it is to be blocked by the local anesthetics. But sir, we get local anesthetics all the time to people that are just laying there. I agree. Now, does it only bind to inactive channels? No. But it will prefer to bind them first, and then it'll bind the other two. That's the academic point there. Because eventually they'll all get blocked. You might see some old fashioned nurses prior to giving book one aesthetic, prior to an IV, start tapping the area. And what are they thinking? I'm going to activate these sodium channels. Make my local anesthetic set up quicker. That is okay, whatever. <laughs> Because anesthesia is all about pleasing the consumer, right? <laughs> Your biggest problems are going to be pain on injection and nausea and vomiting post-op. All right. This is the third time that this slide has come up. And now we're going to relate it to sensation loss and nerve fibers. Okay. What is the first sensation to go that is not up here? Well, it's not really a sensation. What is the first action to go that's not up here? Not sensory, because you can hear that, you feel that. That's what's something you can't control? The autonomic nervous system. Okay. The autonomic nervous system. Now, but if it comes to sensation, your pain goes before your cold fibers, before your heat fibers, before your proprioception and touch, and then the expression. Ah, are they carried by the same? Because you've got different nerve endings. You have free nerve endings. You've got Pacinian corp what is it? Pacinian corp Merkel's disc and Pacinian corp and Rupian and something, something or other. They all have, they have acid sensing channels. You've got, uh, there's going to be special, you may, you're going to have some nerves that are going to be more prone to carry a sensation than other nerves. When, physiologically, this is what you see. When you say autonomics go first, you mean just the afferent? Limb yes, the afferent limb to the autonomics. You definitely get hypotensive first. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm going to test you on the top of this. Pain, followed by cold, followed by warmth, touch, and then deep pressure. I will separately test you on you are the local anesthetic molecule. The first fiber you run into is the B fiber. The second fiber you run into is the C fiber. It's mild. Why is it opposite? There's no myelination on the C fiber. You, you said B before. About the same time, about the same time you begin to lose your autonomic. Architecturally, it is. Now, 
So it's just it's just a flat part of what would be called. Just a thickest filters. But when I block my chronic pain, I'm telling you, at the same time, my automatics are gone. I mean, it's like right together. Right together. The reason that it's just a spilt spit harder to block the B fibers is what? That thin layer of myelination. Huh? 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 Reaches them first. It reaches them first, but. I would say it simultaneously blocks B and C at the same time. All right. But why? Here's the question: Why? Why would it take just a little bit longer for you to realize your C fibers have been blocked? It's your slower transmission. But if you think about those simultaneously, I lose my chronic pain and my autonomics the same way, then you're okay. You'll be all right. Again, I'm just testing you on what the words say on the phone here. But I would test the part two by architecture. The first fiber you run into is your beat fiber. The second fiber is your C fiber. So on and so forth. That's correct. It will, it will attempt, it will, that's wasted local anesthetic. If local anesthetic goes through myelination, I like to look at it as wasted local anesthetic because the only thing that you need to block is the node of Ron VA. How many of them? Three. Three. Is it a surprise that a small myelinated nerve fiber is easier to block than a large myelinated nerve fiber? So again, three nodes, critical length. Critical length. Can't, can't jump three nodes. That impulse cannot jump three nodes. So if you can block three nodes, you're good. Here's a nice cartoon representation of that. And I say, since Carl Lewis is a long jumper, right, he may be able to jump 30 meters, but he can't jump three nodes. Now let's talk about what is going to make local anesthetic disappear. What is going to terminate its activity? One of the big things that you always know is law of mass action, right? The fusion away from the site. That's one of the big things. You get that. The next one is metabolism. If I inject local anesthetic into somebody with liver failure versus Tristan, is Tristan's lidocaine going to last longer, or is the person with liver failure's lidocaine going to last longer? Liver failure. Liver failure. Right? Because double IMI broken down in the liver. That's where you make the esterases as well, correct? Esterases are made in the liver. They're made in cells as well. You have liver esterases. You have red blood cell esterases. You have neuromuscular junction esterases. You have an esterase for just about every kind of tissue you can think of. Captain Ester, double IMI. If you're an ester, right, if you're chloroprocaine, what breaks you down? Your respirators. And do you build up a diffusion gradient quickly? If I chew up chloroprocaine with my esterases, yes. yes. Now I have a huge diffusion gradient to which my chloroprocaine that is trapped inside of my cell can now depart. Vascularity. In order to get things to the liver, what do you need? Circulation. Where you place the local anesthetic is directly proportional to its length of action because of vascularity. If I inject local anesthetic into the intercostal muscle versus I inject it into your subarachnoid space, which one is more vascular? The intercostals. Which one will go away quick? Your intercostals. Now, one of the ways that I can. <coughs> and that's what this is saying here. Uh, one of the things to consider, let me step back just a second, is where you inject it. We just talked about that. I would like you to know 
the top of this graph, mepifacane, because it represents your blood level of your local anesthetic at different sites of injection. The intercostal is highly vascular. I injected into the intercostal area. I can quickly absorb into the bloodstream and carry it away from the site. Versus I inject it into my sciatic nerve and my femoral nerve. The vascularity of those areas is not as great, so I have lower blood levels. So that means that I stay longer at the site. Anybody have trouble reading that? One of the other ways that I can keep local anesthetic from reaching the bloodstream is to use a vasoconstrictor. If I make the vascular area surrounding the local anesthetic smaller, I decrease surface area, and less local anesthetic can get into the bloodstream now. Yes. If I get to the lung and I'm looking to fill it, can you not breathe out some local anesthetic? Absolutely. Plus, if I'm a protein in the lung, I can get stuck there. All right, back to the vasoconstrictor. This cartoon is an attempt to help you visualize that. So if I look at the left and I inject my anesthetic, I don't have any vasoconstrictor in it. I have equal parts of local anesthetic that go to the nerve and to the blood vessel. Now I make the surface area of the blood vessel smaller. And I inject my local anesthetic. I see more local anesthetic going to the nerve and less going to the vascular system. Now the duration of that effect will be, be dependent upon what? The half-life of the vasoconstrictor that you use. Alpha 2 is coming back to haunt Anne. Here we go. Before a new point, you might yeah. step back one time. The, uh, I've been down a couple of slides where you're talking about the vascular Vascular, uh, how vascularized the space is. And we mentioned high vascularization. Yes. Quicker onset. Is that what we said? No. We missed. Okay. Quicker offset. Quicker offset because of the vascular. So because of the vascular. If, if an area is vascular, it's going to carry away the local anesthetic from the site. Right. Terminate its activity quicker. So, and that, and that, and that slide where we did the vasoconstriction. Yep. It's a faster. That's a way you can extend the block in a vascular area. That's, that's a way you can extend the block in an A vascular. Yeah, so, that's, so that's the epi addition, it's like constriction effect. Yep, you could give epi in the subarachnoid space, or uh, you give epi in your peripheral nerve block, and that epi will stick around as long as there's not a lot of blood flow, but the epi that's there is going to cause vasoconstriction. That vasoconstriction makes a smaller surface area of blood, and so less stuff can be carried away, so it stays at the area longer. You can use epinephrine, you can use phenylephrine. Those are two vasoconstrictors that are commonly used with local anesthetic. So more, so more blood at that site is going to cause a slower onset than essentially Has nothing to do with onset. Okay. Onset has to do with concentration delivery. Okay. Got it. Your previous slide, I'm too Where is caudal? Oh, where is the caudal space? You don't remember Christy showing you in the. It's your butt. It's your sacral hiatus. Yeah, no problem. That's your butt. Kind of your butt. You'll never do a caudal block on an adult because you'll never be able to find it. You'll do it in kids, though, because it's easy to find. All right. Uh, the good major up here just spoke about epinephrine. So that is the typical vasoconstrictor used. And if you use it in a central nervous block, not only does it vasoconstrict, but it also helps deepen your block. Because what receptor does it stimulate? Alpha 2. So if you stimulate alpha 2 in the nervous system, you are going to cause hyperpolarization of the nerve, 
and hyperpolarization creates resistance to electrical activity, and thus you decrease nerve transmission. Okay. So when you're at phase two, and I ask you the two things that epinephrine does for your block, you're able to tell me vasoconstriction and alpha two stimulation. Aside from pawns, is the main way like alpha two agonists that can be formulated, or are there other? I've never heard of Presidex being put in neuraxially, and I'll have to do a lot with its preservatives. Um, clonidine, I do think that they make a preservative free of clonidine. So anything that you inject into the nervous tissue, you want to try to make sure that it's preservative free. But some of the preservatives that are in these solutions, and there's some local anesthetics that have preservatives in them, so you need to make sure the vial says preservative free. Um, you could get some nervous irritation, and then you don't want that issue hanging over your head. Now, Katie says, sir, what about bicarb? I have an answer. Does bicarb change the pKa of the drug? It does not. It only changes the pKa of the environment. And so if I inject bicarb into the body, I make that area of the body more basic less hydrogen ions in that specific area. If I have less hydrogen ions in that specific area, and then I inject, or I inject simultaneously my local anesthetic, what do I have now? I have more of my local anesthetic in the basic form by itself. And if it's in the basic form by itself, it is not charged. So what can it do then? It can penetrate membranes. Absolutely. So that's why you add bicarb. Or if you're in Canada, you might actually buy pre-carbonated local anesthetic. But carbonation or bicarb does not change the pKa, only the pH of the environment. Now one of the last and very important things is protein binding. The reason, one of the reasons that marcaine or ropivacaine lasts such a long time is that they are highly protein bound. They stick to proteins very well. And so if you stick very well, it's very hard to unstick. And you need to unstick in order to get into the blood to go to the liver or to meet your fate at the hands of an esterase. Right? So let's look at that concept with lidocaine. Lidocaine has somewhat of a protein binding, but we could have put any local anesthetic up here. And now we're going to get back to that whole free fraction of drug. If I inject local anesthetic into the body of someone who has liver disease, are they going to have a quicker onset or a slower onset than somebody who doesn't have liver disease? A quicker onset. A quicker, and why did you say that? There's more free drug. There's more free drug. There's more concentration. Even though it's huh? quicker onset. If you have less protein to bind to, then you 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 fundamentally increased your concentration. Even though I gave Justin 20 cc's of two percent, and I gave my grandmother 20 cc's of two percent in the epidural, he had more protein everywhere. So academically. His onset will be slower than hers because she's going to have more of a free fraction of that drug available. What, what's AAD? Oh, acid, um, alpha 1 acid glycoprotein. It comes back again. So, what are some disease processes that can cause you to increase your free fraction of drug? Well, nephrotic syndrome. Okay, got it. Uh, neonates, all right, <clears throat> got it. Uh, myocardial infarction will actually cause more drug to be bound. What do you know about alpha-1 acid glycoprotein since we're talking about it? When does it rear its ugly head? Inflammatory states. In states of stress and inflammation. This red box is red for a reason. If 
I want to just discuss the speed of onset, the characteristic that I am most prone to look at is pKa. Right? I'm not looking. I just want you to pick one factor. I'm not talking about concentration. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm saying purely based upon uh, the quality of the molecule. pKa is going to determine your onset. If I'm talking specifically about the molecule, the duration of action is going to be linked to protein binding capabilities. And if I'm talking about specifically that molecule, lipid solubility will determine its potency. Questions on that? So, if I am talking about protein binding, what end of the architecture of the amino acid am I talking about? Amino. Oh, the amino acid, the loquine aesthetic. Yeah. The amino group. The amino group determines your binding. If I'm talking about lipophilicity, what end? The, the main thing is the ring. Do I, do I agree with you that the carbon length also affects it? Yes. But if you had to pick the best answer, it's the aromatic ring. All right. Huh? That's lipophilicity. Yes. Now, pKa, what part of the cartoon, the aromatic ring or the amino group, will, be, will influence pKa the most? Huh? Is it if you had to pick one, either the aromatic ring or the amino end. The amino end. Because that deals with charge. <laughs> Many of you have probably used loquine aesthetics and didn't even realize that there were preservatives in them. Many of you, you understand that there's preservatives in them. But there's a couple preservatives that we have to look out for. Paramino benzoic acid, right? You have to ask your patients if you're going to do a field block or a surface block, if you're not going to inject this to the surface, it's going to be that emergency system. Let's say you want to use the top. You'll have to find out if they're allergic to cosmetics or some lotion because they tend to have the same preservative. Methylparaben is another preservative that may trigger allergic responses. But never, ever, 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 ever inject a local anesthetic with any type of preservative into the central neuraxis. Yes, so they'll make a, they'll have lidocaine PF. If you see something PF, they usually indicate preservative free. Go ahead. All right, so now we've jumped from structure, and now we're starting to talk about some allergies and now some side effects. Who here has had local anesthetic injected into their body? And did you experience any of this? The, oh my God, my ears feel like the thing is quieting now. It's starting to ring a little bit. So if you ever get this injected directly into your intravenous system, like I have, so it's local anesthetic toxicity, that's what we're talking about here. So if I get some into my vascular tree, I'm going to find my way to my tongue, to my brain, and I'm going to start to kind of slur my words, I'm going to get a little lightheaded, my ears are going to either ring or it's going to feel like they're caving in. The sound is starting to go away and cave in, right? And then I can feel my mind just kind of shut down. It was pretty scary. Because soon after that, you're either going to convulse or your heart's going to stop. <laughs> and that's not good. So luckily, it was lidocaine, which has a very short half-life. Now, had it been marcaine, 
We'll discuss that problem in a little bit. Now, if you're doing a peripheral nerve block and you've never had a seizure, then you've not done enough peripheral nerve blocks. Because eventually in your career, it will happen. And that is when you've injected that local anesthetic directly into the intravenous system. And your patient, you're, this is what you do. You say, you let me know if your tongue gets numb, if your lips start to get numb, if you get a ringing in your ears, right? If you start tasting funny stuff, right? Because that's what will happen. They'll start talking to you and they'll start slurring their speech. And, and then you just stop injecting. Make sure you stop injecting at that point, Okay. Take the needle out, come back to it later. But let's say you continue to inject. Well, eventually, they're going to convulse because you they went right from, you know, I feel a little numb in the tongue to convulsions. And that probably had to do with a little bit of your speed of injection. That could influence it. Is, is there any standard of care? Like, the patient probably prefer to be out when we do the nerve block, or is there, like, the standard of care we do it while they're awake specifically look for this? What do you think is going to be your friend to be neuroprotective? The gasoline. You're going to make sure they're comfortable. Right? And there's some strategies we'll talk about. But you can decrease the amount of local <coughs> anesthetic that is going to reach the systemic circulation through what we talked about with the basic constriction. We talked about basic constriction. It makes sense that if you have someone who has a problem with proteins, they're not making enough of it, then their tendency for toxicity goes up because there's more free drug. One thing you might say is, sir, this is a local anesthetic. It's supposed to shut things down. Why do you get a seizure? One thing you have to remember about the brain is it's organized. You've got parts that are responsible for inhibition, and you've got parts that are responsible for excitation. So just by knowing that, where do you think there's preferential delivery, or where could you speculate that there's preferential delivery once the local anesthetic arrives in the circulation? The inhibitory centers. So if you stop the activity of the inhibitory centers of the brain, it should make sense on why you might see convulsive activity. And that's a question that I typically ask every year. Now, going back to the heart, did anybody have any trouble with that example I gave about the infarcted heart, the ischemic heart, and the low point aesthetic? Why did it seem to work? Because excitable tissue. Low point aesthetics prefer to bind to excitable tissue. And you know that ischemic heart tissue is excitable, meaning that there's probably a proportion of those voltage-gated sodium channels that are in the inactive state. And academically, you know that local anesthetics prefer to bind to the inactive state. You all get why I say academically, right? Because clinically, it doesn't matter. But academically, is what you see on your boards. They're born. Bupipacaine is a great, great drug, but it has some inherent problems with its toxicity issues. It's a great drug because it binds proteins very well, but it's a very toxic drug because it binds proteins very well. You all making that connection? It's nice <coughs> if it blocks a sodium channel in nerves. It's not so good if it blocks a sodium channel in the heart. Because it doesn't come off quickly. It has what's called this fast in, slow out kinetic profile. Its pKa is 8.3, right? It's not real close to physiologic pH, but it's not like chloroprocaine where it's 9.3. So it uncharges relatively easily, it finds its way to its target fairly quickly, and then it saves it and it's hard to remove. That's that fast in, slow out kinetic profile. 
Anybody here want to take a stab at why hyperkalemia will potentiate local anesthetic toxicity? More excitable cell. Huh? More excitable cell. That's part of it. What else? Closer to the threshold. Huh? Okay, that's part of it. One thing you don't know is that these sodium channels, if you the body's always wanting to maintain homeostasis, right? So if you've got a, a chemical gradient disturbance, then you've messed up your electrical gradient disturbance. And so when you're hyperkalemic, right, you're going to alter the function of your sodium channels, not only through membrane potential changes, but actual channel configuration changes. It'll become more proficient, more efficient, those channels are, so they fire more readily. All right, we've changed that voltage. And so now that you've changed that voltage and those channels want to fire more frequently, then um, what else shows up more frequently? More inactivated channels. Toxicity in pregnancy always rears its head because pregnant women take this steroid called progesterone that has its own inherent nervous system blockade. And as a result, the same dose of a local anesthetic now has a greater toxicity. Progesterone will alter the function of the sodium channel and create its own local anesthetic type effect. Now, can you calculate how much, how, how toxic the local anesthetic is? Well, you can estimate it through this term called CC-CNS ratio. This is always a stickler every year, so try to, try to get a grip on, a grip on this. So a CC to CNS ratio, this is the ratio of the dose to cause cardiovascular collapse over the dose required to see CNS symptoms. What would be CNS symptoms? Ringing of the ears, slurring speech. So it's that distance between what's going to make your heart stop versus what will make you start feeling numbness in your mouth. Okay. Now, do you want that to be a big ratio or a low ratio? Big. You want it to be big. Ideally, I would like to have a drug that takes 100 times the dose to make your mouth numb, to make my heart stop. But those numbers aren't realistic. But there are some realistic numbers in lidocaine. Lidocaine is roughly 7 to 1, I believe. So it takes 7 times the dose that makes your lips numb. This is just an example. Sometimes the dose that makes your lips numb to make your heart stop. Now, your pipicane has a ratio of 2 to 3. So that dose that makes your heart stop is pretty darn close to the dose that makes your ears start to ring. Okay? Yes? <laughs> 2 to 3 over 1. 2 hyphen 3 over 1. that concept okay? Right. What, was it? what was it two or three? That was you put the pen. We're going to stop for today. Two more slides. Oh, two slides, that's it? <laughs> oh, we're not going to stop for today. <laughs> we're going to drive on. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so... Other toxic effects of local anesthetics. What do you know about cocaine that's different from the other local anesthetics? It has both metabolism. They increase metabolism. When metabolism goes up, what, what does heart rate do? It goes up. And when heart rate goes up, are your sodium channels firing faster or slower? Faster. faster. So you have more sodium channels in the inactive state. 
and you increase your toxicity of your cocaine that way. Does that make sense? So cocaine will make you numb and lightning speed all at the same time. <laughs> Hypersensitivity reactions and low point aesthetics. If you had to remember a class of drug that has the most common allergic type of reactions, it's the esters. And no matter what people tell you, there is no cross sensitivity between an ester class and an amide class. But here is a question. My doctor told me I went to the dentist and uh, I'm allergic to Novocaine. What does it do to you, sir? Makes my heart rate go up. What do you think was probably added to that Novocaine? There you go. We talked about PABA, and once we start talking more about the specific drugs, we'll find out where this PABA is at and what local anesthetic it's linked to. I don't know if we talked about PABA. Paramino benzoic acid. We didn't talk about that? Yeah, that's preservative. Who is today? That's okay. I ain't, it's all good. <laughs> I don't think we talked about it. We haven't held screen a minute ago. Oh, wait. All right. Wait a minute. <laughs> Paraben, uh, you know, Pava, Paraben, whatever. Anyway, Pava will, in will influence antibiotics of the sulfonamide type. Whatever. I don't expect me to ask you that one. All right. I think the next time we meet, we're hitting, um, I think that's it for the locals. Yeah, we hit opioids next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>